There he is. I'm sorry. I was. I don't know why this no. computer just never does this to me. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, Pastor. Let me call y'all on the phone line and get going. My apologies. I was couldn't get my computer to come on at first, but it's coming on now. It's on now. Let me get my phone on. How's everyone doing on Zoom? As I get everybody else up, y'all doing good? Yes, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Well, I'm yeah, glad we good. I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. Come on, phone. <laughs> There you go, phone. Okay, phone's on. I don't use this phone for class. Really. All right, now I got there. We go pray. Welcome to the conference line for St. Peter Missionary Baptist Church. All right, there we are. We're together. Good evening, phone line. Good evening, Zoom line. It is a pleasure to see everyone this evening on this. Uh, this Wednesday evening, as we come together again to study the Word of God. Wednesday, December 8th, uh, 2021, as we work in the word of the Lord today, uh, we're going to be in the book of Second Peter, uh, chapter 2 today, Second Peter, chapter 2. Uh, we have seen in chapter 1, uh, Peter has presented for us uh, some biblical truths. He's done a lot of work with us. He's, he's given us a lot of things to understand, to see in we are. Chapter two, we're going to learn the why. We're going to learn the why uh, Peter uh, gave us this information, why Peter uh, shared with us uh, in regards to uh, what he told us in chapter one. We know in chapter one, he gave us, in, in, right off the rip, he told us what we what we expect. And the part I want to hold on to tonight is the fact that he said that we have um, the ability to receive um, multiplied peace and grace uh, as a result of God's word. That's what he said, as a result of our knowledge of God. That's what he said first. And so in that chapter one, he says that very vividly. He moves on after verse five and lets us know there's work we need to do. He explains those things. We have to give diligence, virtue, knowledge, temperance, and, and patience to these things. He said, lets us know that. He moves on, lets us know as well. We should uh, add to our body, our basis of faith, our foundation of faith, um, brotherly kindness and love, all right? And godliness. Um, and he lets us know if we do these things, chapter one, verse eight, um, that, that, that in these things are bound, that we should be fruitful. He says that we should never need to be bearing no unfruitful. So the converse is true. We shall be fruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, knowledge will lead us to a place where we will bear the fruit that God wants us to bear in our lives. God does not want us to be um, um, just live. He wants us to bear fruit. He didn't, he didn't plan us. He didn't call us to be Christians for us just to go through the world or go through life benefiting ourselves. He calls us to be Christians so that we could be blessings to others, and that requires us to be fruitful. Um, he reminds us that there's a necessity of, of doing diligence, um, um, of, of, of the diligence is necessary, that diligence that we give to doing these things that have been outlined in verses 5 through five through 6 and 7 is, is important because it allows us to know that our walk is true. Some Christians walk around not quite sure salvation because there's nothing, there's no increased knowledge of God. There is no, and I'm, I'm going to take my time on this because chapter two is important. There's no increased knowledge of God and then there's no fruit being born. In other words, who, who wants to be um, a, um, a part of something and, and there's no real benefit of it or there's no real evidence of it. And so likewise, he's letting us know the necessity of, of this posture of Christ, um, this posture of knowledge for God allows us to bear fruit and us to be more certain about our calling. Um, he tells us why he teaches. He says, I'm teaching you this because uh, no matter how many times you hear it, it continues to build you up, to establish you in the presence. He says, so as long as I'm living, I'm going to continue to share these truths with you so that you may be stirred up and you may be reminded of the truth. And again, that's important for us to understand as Christians constantly. We should 
be reminded of the truth. All of us have read Psalm 23. Everybody on here read it countless times, but every time we read it, it's just stirring us a desire to have the same level of confidence and trust and dependence on God as David did. And it should not just be, we say, oh, David was great. We should say, I want to have that same, I want to know, and I want to live in the concept of the reality that the Lord is my shepherd. Um, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gone soon, but my desire is that even after I'm gone that you remember these things. And that'll be every Christian's desire that, I, that those we love whether it be family members, children, friends, uh, church, um, brothers, sisters in Christ, that we should share the gospel with them so that even after we've gone, they still know Christ. One of the, the lessons, and I thank the Lord for this all the time uh, in regard to my parents. I thank God for what they taught me um, because in teaching me, there's some things I never forgot. And not just the verse, but the implementation of the verse. And all of us, I think, got to, somebody just share it with you. It may not be a family, maybe friends, or maybe somebody you learn church, but they share something with you that stays with you. How many got somebody that something was taught to you that you hold on to it today uh, because you learned it in times past? And so um, he reminds us at the end of chapter one that, that this is where I want to stay. Verse 20 says, knowing this verse, there's no prophecy of the scriptures in the private interpretation. But verse 21, he lets us know where prophecy comes from. Prophecy comes from and came from in the old times, by, not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that's what he says, and that's how he closes out chapter one. And so if he stopped the chapter one, we would be strengthened. If he, if he stopped the chapter one, we would be blessed. If he just didn't say nothing else past chapter one, we would at bare minimum know the basis of the foundation that we have in Christ. We would know that, and we would know that knowledge is essential, but not just in not just the not just knowledge of its of the words, but again the understanding of those words, and most importantly, the knowledge of God. He was clear: the knowledge of God. The more we know about God, comes from our knowledge of His Word. You can't find out about God unless you're in His Word. No, it's just doesn't work like that. You got to know more about God, um, and in order, and that brings you that brings us to a knowledge of His Word. So it's kind of a reciprocating uh, action. No God, no his word, no his word, no God. And so he says that. Now look at chapter two. Now I'm in chapter two now. And now Paul, Peter rather, tells us why he had chapter one and why he said all he said. He said, but, now normally, um, but um, negates what was said before. And, no, I shouldn't say normally in some cases, but in other cases, like 50-50. The other times, but is a conjunction. And it clarifies. So in this case, it clarifies. Peter said, the reason why I told you all these things is found in chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Listen to this. Who privately or privately bring in damnable heresies, heresies that will send people to hell, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves with destruction. Peter says, just as sure, as the word of God was given to holy men of God, who then in turn spake as they were spoken to. Peter says that was the case. He said, but also present during those times were false prophets. He said that even in the very beginning, in the very beginning, there were always, there were false prophets who were among the people. And that's important that he used that verbiage. The false preachers went outside the people. They were among the people. There were, in other words, there were Jews um, you had the prophets, but you also had at the same time false prophets who had a credited message while they hid in the midst of the people. Y'all remember in the book of Jeremiah, the Lord just showed me this, the book of Jeremiah, even as Jeremiah was prophesying to the people of, of Jerusalem, people of Judah, even the people of, of all of Israel, and told them the necessity of positioning and preparing themselves for the long haul because God was going to punish them because of their disobedience to God. That's what Jeremiah said. But there were other folk who were countermanding or giving an alternate message. I don't know what Jeremiah is talking about. God's about to bless us. We ain't got to worry about nothing. God's going to bring us out just because he want to bring us out. It don't have nothing to do with what Jeremiah is talking about. We did good. We fine. Y'all worry about God um, um, punishing you. There's no reason to worry. God's going to bring us out. And you remember what happened? Jeremiah had to stand um, boldly and declare um, all his scriptures and all the, all the words of God regarding um, there's nothing too hard for God and that God had an expected end for us. He, he declared these things. But what happened? The people were punished. Why? Because God said so. And God spoke through this holy man, Jeremiah, to tell the truth. My point is there was there were, uh, there were false teachers who's there who just saying whatever. And, and Peter is saying today they're false teachers. And, and the false teaching, and I said this before, and we're going to keep saying it again. False teaching is not another religion. 
false people is people taking the Holy Scripture, the word of God, and perverting it so that it meets the needs of people versus representative of the will of God. False teachers will tell you, that, you know, that there's no need necessary to accept Christ as your Savior. That's what false teachers tell you. You know, God, God, you need for God to take you to heaven. You just can, you know, be a good person. Have I ever heard that one? You just be a good person. Salvation requires, okay, the acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior. It requires a public confession, and it re requires a, a internal belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior, that God that Jesus died for us and God raised him from the dead. There are countless numbers even today. And again, it's very subtle. And that's why he used the word privily. He said, a false teacher doesn't come and say, hey, I'm a false teacher. No, that's not what a false teacher does. A false teacher comes with a, a message that is mesmerizing, a message that is appealing to the carnal or the base nature of people. And, and each carnal message leaves Jesus out more and more and more. They come talking about God without Jesus. And Jesus doesn't want us to, because that's why Jesus said this, no man comes to the Father but what? But by me. Now he said that. And so as anybody tries to usurp Jesus out of the gospel or out of the teachings regarding God and the relationship with him and Jesus Christ, that person then is teaching falsely. Now look what he says. Um, These teachers shall privately, privately, subtly, slickly bring in damnable heresies. Again, what is the heresy? The heresy is anything that removes Christ from the teaching. And those heresies um, uh, uh, include, look what he says in verse one, denying the Lord that bought them, denying the Lord, denying Jesus as savior. See, the enemy, Satan doesn't want us to believe in Jesus because he knows that leads to our salvation. He wants the believer, even the one who's declared faith in Christ, he wants the believer to equivocate, to wonder, when do I need this Jesus? Can I just go with God? Because Jesus, you know, you know, he was all right, but God, I think I can just deal with him in a very generic sense. And that's what that's what the false teachers wanted to have happen. And he says, and those false teachers themselves would deny the Lord. And he says they looked like Christians. They acted like Christians. They dressed like Christians. They hung out with Christians. I mean, I'm sorry. They hung out with people of God and hung out. They acted like they were people of God. They were at the temple hanging out. They did all these things, but they ultimately, they were denying the Lord that bought them. What, why does he say bought? Because in, in truth, it is God who delivers us. It is Jesus who does the work of the deliverance. He paid the price. So therefore, that's where he gets the word bought from. And, and then those people that deny the Lord bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, hold on to that word, swift destruction. We're going to come back at this in a second. Now, in verse 2. This it's almost like Peter was sad and crying when he said this. He said, the problem is many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. He said, not if the problem ain't that the false prophets are among the people. He said, the real problem, the real sad part is that some people will follow false prophets. All right, let me stop here. Again, false teaching is slick and subtle. You can identify it by its leaving Christ out and inserting something else. Oftentimes what is inserted is a person, a man, that people begin to honor, love, respect. Look at a man, a person, a one person, it could be man or woman, for salvation. Then the second phase of it is it begins to cause people to say, well, you know, I'm comfortable with this because this allows me to do this, that, and the other, and doesn't allow me to require me to be in constant relationship with the Lord. I'm free. I can do whatever I want to do because this person has said that the, the work the, the work of the Lord, the work of Christ, it wasn't necessary. That we didn't, Jesus didn't have to die for my sins because it's not that big a deal. It starts real suddenly. And people who want to say, oh yeah, I'm in church and don't want to really do, you know, have a relationship with the Lord. And, it's, and the crazy thing is God just wants a relationship with us. That's what he wants. That's what he's asking for, a relationship. But some people want the blessings without the relationship. That's what they want. And so... Peter is simply saying here that their, their, their ways are persnickious. They're very, they're subtle, but they're poisonous. And he said, and, and their actions, the false teachers and those who follow them, um, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be even spoken of, they end up talking about how Christian, Christian folk are, well, folk, they, that church over there, they always want to follow the Lord. They always want to study the Bible. You know, we're free. It starts like that. Now, let me stop here because the Lord told me to tell you this night. Let us be careful. And because we talked about this in our three consecutive books. Not one time that I picked the book. Each time God sent me to the book. And here we are again. And I want to say this. 
false teaching exists in the world today, and Christians have to be careful. What's the what's the what's the you know um, Peter or uh, John said it just like this in Second John. He said we got to contend, we got to work. What does that mean? Let me stay in the word. The way you know, and the way you are, are, are not you know vulnerable to false teachings is because you know the word of God. One of the things that's happening now. And you'll see it on TV. And this is not about the vaccinations, but this is really more about false teachings. There are people who are teaching and, and they're teaching. They're, they got they know the Bible because they know the Bible because there's a guy who was on the day that was, you know, had been teaching. Don't take the vaccination. And he was basing all upon the premise. It was a political premise, not a Christian premise. You know, I, I, I to argue using the Bible that such and such person is right. In this case, you're talking about Donald Trump. We should follow him. That's the problem. Because who's missing in that equation? Jesus. He's missing. It would be wrong if I was to stand here and say, we can just trust Joe Biden. Why? Because who's out of the equation? Jesus. And so this is what we have to be aware of and careful of. And he says this, that that, that these people um, shall lead people to a way that is evil, that causes the truth, what we believe in Christ to be evil spoken of. Now, verse 3 says it better. And through covetousness. What is covetousness? You know, chasing after something or someone. You know, years ago it used to be this thing called this this um, prosperity prosperity gospel. Oh, if you just do this, you'll get money. You have a car. You have whatever house you want. You have whatever you want. That was the that was the focal point. Not Christ. Christ was ancillary. Relationship with God was ancillary. And there will always be some false teaching that proliferates because many shall follow. And he said that covenant shall shall look at this verse three shall with, they with feigned words, fake words, make merchandise of you. The false teacher does not have any concern about the spiritual lives and eternal lives of those who he is faking out. It is all about themselves. It's all about self-promotion. It's all about being about them, all about them uh, aligning their popularity, their positions, their pockets. That's what it's about. He said, these feigned words will make merchandise. That's why he says the way merchandise. He said, it's not about your, your salvation. It's about you being a, 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 a piece of um, merchandise. I, I saw on the TV today that Kim Kardashian has now um, began to sell fashion stuff. Now, I'm not talking about Kim Kardashian. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. She all of a sudden wanted to sell fashion. Why? Because right now, people are buying clothes. So what I was hearing that she makes, this is, she makes these clothes out of subpar materials, but she sells them for a high price. Why? Because they say Kim Kardashian. And some people will follow Kim Kardashian around the cliff. And as a result, you know, the people... She's not concerned about them having good clothes. She's concerned about what, what the people buying her merchandise. The false teacher uses us the same way. The false teacher uses people the same way, I should say, as merchandise. Verse 3, he says, whose judgment, now this is a key thing, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. Peter says this, the false teacher will pay. The false teacher will endure eternal damnation. He said, it may seem like their judgment is a long time off. And it's and then, and then there, it's almost like Peter said, it may seem like that case is on hold. He said, don't worry about it. That damnation is slumbered not, it's on the way. Verse four, he said, for if God, look at this. He's in this white, this is what he's basing on. He said, for those of you who say, well, you know, if they're false teachers, why God not punishing them? He said, they're going to get punished. He's telling the church, Christians, they're going to get punished. So before you think that the fact they're not burned up is indicative of the fact that they are righteous. He said, understand this, that punishment is coming. So what we must know is we must know that anything that usurps Jesus out of the equation is false teaching. Now, here's why Peter says that punishment is coming. Look at verse four. I'm going to read verse four and five and six together. He said, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved into judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And, verse 8, that's verse 6, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned, with an over, condemned them with an overthrow, making them unto those that, that after should live ungodly. Peter said this, if God cast down the angels into hell and reserved, and kept and keeping them in hell, until judgment day if god destroyed the earth because in chapter 6 of genesis verse 5 it says the people did as they felt they fought they had no intention of obeying god they just did whatever was in their minds and their hearts if god 
turn the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes um, as a result of their ungodly behavior. God will punish the ungodly. God will punish false teachers. You remember that right there? The angels that, that rebelled against God got cast into hell. You remember that? That's where Satan, Satan got cast out of heaven. All right? Um, the, 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 in, in Noah, remember, was preaching righteousness. Wasn't nobody listening. Nobody. Noah and his family were the only folk who heard the message of deliverance. They don't, you remember what happened? Uh, God told Noah, Noah, go out there in that desert in the middle of this drought and build an ark. Everybody was just hooping and hollering and laughing. It was like they laughed all day, every day. I can imagine they went back home and said, that boy Noah crazy. He out there building an ark. It ain't even raining. He in the desert over and over again. But God did what? He destroyed the whole world by the flood. The city of Sodom and Gomorrah, where the people were so sensual and sexual. And, and, and when I say sensual and sexual, they were so into self. They were so into self-lust that what happened was God then condemned them, making them examples of those that should live ungodly. God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? So people will know God, God hates and abhors evil. Now, just as surely as God destroyed evil, and I want y'all to watch these next few verses because this is a revelation. God delivered just Lot. Now, when it says just Lot, it don't mean just Lot. It means that Lot was just. Now, just had, Lot had a wrestling match because Lot hung around sin, and he was vexed with the field of conversation of the week. In other words, he never could pull himself clear, but God delivered him. Why? Because God saw Lot's heart. In verse 8, it says this, for that righteous man dwelling among them, that's Lot, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with the unlawful deeds. God saw that despite the fact that Lot was in the wrong place, in a bad place, that it vexed his soul, that he was not comfortable, he did not accept it. He did not say, oh, yeah, this is the way to live. He wrestled with it. He may have engaged in, in the thoughts, but he did not consume, it did not consume him. And therefore, God delivered him because God saw Lot as righteous. The funny thing is, the people around Lot might not have seen it, but God saw him. It is important for us, going back to 2 John, to contend, to, to, to wrestle with the, the, the carnal flesh. Back to Romans chapter 6 and 7, there's two people. Nick Thomas, you remember that? We talked maybe Nick Thomas talked about this a long time ago. Flesh man, spiritual man, got to wrestle. Don't let your flesh man get, don't let it pin you, your spiritual man. How do we avoid that? By prayer, by study of God's word, praise and worship and service. Therefore, our spiritual man gets stronger. So uh, this, this in verse eight, God, verse seven, eight, God did deliver laws. He was righteous in God's eyes. Now, I'm, this is the part I want to focus on just for a minute. I know time is almost up, but let me get two verses, okay? Give me two verses. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the ungodly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust in the day of judgment to be punished. How God does it, Peter doesn't say. Peter just says, the Lord knows. The Lord knows how to deliver the, the godly out of temptations. In other words, God knows how to deliver us out of circumstances and situations. How I believe if we had time tonight, we could sit here and we could think about times that God led us from destructive behavior. Couldn't somebody, couldn't, let me raise my hand. How many of us can say, we don't know how God got us out of where we were, but God did it. Somebody can say God did it. God did it. We were turned around, but God delivered us. And that's the part I love. God, he knows how to do it. Sometimes and I tell somebody, this is, what you gonna, can you work with that person? I say, I'm going to pray for that person, and I'm going to do what God tells me to do because God knows where. I can't figure out how to deliver somebody. Why? Because I'm not a deliverer. But I can point you to the deliverer. And that's why he said the Lord knows how to deliver. So our focus should be on God because God knows how to deliver the godly. And again, he looks, talks, he can see our heart. The pr truth is, people around us, somebody right are, are here today on the phone or Zoom line that, that your people, people still look at you like, they used to run with me. But look at them now. They, 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 were, they were dirty just like I was. No, but God saw your heart. God saw our heart. And he delivered us because God, what? Somebody say, he knows how to deliver us, the godly out of temptations. And God knows how to reserve the unjust into the day of judgment. God knows how to deliver and God knows how to punish. That is what I want us to understand in these first nine verses. The reason why one was important because the knowledge of God is important for us to be able to stand in the midst of false teachings. And for somebody who, and Peter wants us to understand that false teachings are not harmless. They're hurtful because people go to hell following the wrong thing. And he lets us know that they will be punished. Don't look and say, well, so-and-so, look, he ain't telling the truth, but he's still here. God is going to punish because God knows how to punish.
But thank God, he also knows how to deliver. His deliverance. That gave me a different perspective on God's deliverance. God delivered us so that he could deliver us. God delivered us out of, out of, out of a difficult situation so that he could deliver us unto salvation. I like that right there. I might preach that one Sunday soon. Somebody jot that down for me. That's the beauty of the power of God. He can deliver us out of situations so that he can deliver us unto salvation, that he can deliver us into eternal life. I'm going to stop at 729 tonight, and I thank God for each of you. I thank God for his word, most of all, and I pray that this word will just find itself in our hearts, that we may be stronger and better equipped to do two things. First of all, to resist false teaching, and second of all, to teach and be able to share with those who are who are vulnerable and may who even may be deciding to follow false teachings to instead follow Jesus Christ. We're getting equipped. We're getting equipped to walk in righteousness. We're also getting equipped to help others walk in righteousness. God bless you tonight. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and who is our Savior, who we know for a fact, oh God, that we know that Jesus died for us and you raised him from the dead. We come tonight to say thank you for these verses, these nine verses in 2 Peter chapter 1. And we pray, God, that these words would get in our hearts that we may be strengthened in you, that our inner man be strengthened so that we can resist the fiery darts of temptation, that we may resist, Lord, that which would, would hurt us. And then, Lord, we'd be capable of helping those, Lord, who are in trouble. I pray, God, that your word would get in our hands and feet that we can serve you better. Let your word get in our ears so that we can hear your word over the, the, the noise of the world. Lord, let your word get in our minds so that we can have peace and surpass it, all understanding. Let your word get in our minds, Lord, again, so that the fiery darts of Satan will be quenched. Let your word, Lord, get in our lungs, our vocal cords, our throats, even on our lips and tongues, that we may declare your word to a dying world, to each other. And to ourselves. God, I pray that you bless every household, every family, and every individual believer that is on here tonight. In Jesus' name, we just say thank you, Lord, and amen. God bless you, St. Peter. Hold on, phone, Zoom line. God bless you, phone.